Understanding evolution is critical to understanding biology. It's like the glue that holds the whole thing together. Did you know that there are up to 13,000 different species of moss and 380,000 species of beetle? Now, how did all these different individuals come into being? Was it divine creation that made each individual species? Well, evolution explains how primitive life forms evolved into this incredible diversity of life that we have on our planet today. Evolution is basically the story of life on Earth. And if you look at fossils, then you are basically looking at all these past pages from this story of, of the life on planet Earth. Here is an example. This image shows just one part of the story of how whales evolved from four-legged terrestrial mammals into sea-dwelling animals that we've got today. Now, what exactly is evolution? Well, evolution is basically the change in the heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. Darwin, Charles Darwin, is often hailed as the person who formulated the theory of evolution. However, the theory was actually first officially presented to the Linnaean Society as a joint paper with another scientist called Alfred Russell Wallace in 1858. Now, the idea of evolution wasn't completely new, but what they proposed was a method by which it could occur. And this process, this method, was called natural selection. Now, they worked completely independently, but they ended up arriving at the same conclusions. Darwin accumulated evidence over a long, long period of time supporting the idea that living organisms could change with time. He got this evidence from the, his, his various voyages, places like the Galapagos Islands, from geological evidence, fossil evidence that he collected, and his own small experiments. Wallace accumulated evidence to support his ideas from the Amazon and the Malay archipelago. Now Darwin ends up getting more fame as he had a bigger body of evidence and a deeper development of the idea of natural selection, which is the process which causes evolution. He outlined this in his famous book on the origin of species by means of natural selection, which was first published in 1859. Now the main observations and ideas that led Darwin and Wallace to the theory of natural selection were variation, fecundity, population sizes, survival rates and inheritance. What we'll do is we'll briefly talk about these observations that they made uh, within these categories. So let's start off with fecundity and populations. Now fecundity is basically the, the word that means the reproductive rate of an organism. How quickly do they reproduce? And what Darwin noticed was that organisms tend to overproduce. They produce more offspring than they need to. However, he also noticed that population size doesn't really change. It stays about stable. For example, if you look at a robin, a robin usually lays a clutch of four eggs. Now, if all these survive and they lay four more each, then there would be 16. And if this continues for 10 generations, there would be 1,048,576 robins. Now, this clearly doesn't happen. Otherwise, the world would be overrun in millions of species very, very, very quickly in a matter of a few days if all the offspring that were born by, from organisms actually survived. Now, another thing that they noticed was the idea of survival. They, they saw nature as a battleground. Organisms are constantly fighting each other in order to survive. They're competing on a daily basis for food, for shelter, for mates, to avoid predators and disease. They also observed that in every generation, there were small differences in the offspring. Now, these variations could be passed on to the next generation. Darwin was really interested in this, and he did loads and loads of experiments, breeding experiments with pigeons to study artificial selection and inheritance and how characteristics and variations get passed on from generation to generation. Now, when they put all these ideas together over a long period of time, in some cases, Darwin had years and years and years to think about, about these observations that he made on his travels, and uh, Wallace, it all came to him during a sort of malarial fever that he had. Um, but they put these pieces of the puzzle together and came up with the idea, the, f uh, the process of natural selection, which is what causes evolution. So this is an outline of how natural selection works. Number one, variation. 
A reshuffling of alleles occurs during meiosis and sexual reproduction. Random mutations cause new alleles to appear in the population. Therefore, there are variations occurring with each generation of offspring. Overproduction. Now, if you produce more, it increases competition. Number three, there is a struggle for survival. Certain environmental factors, we call these selection pressures, are gonna favor some of these individuals over other ones. Number four, selective advantage. Now, those individuals with variations that, or adaptations that allows them to survive these selection pressures, they'll be the ones that will survive. And if they survive, they will be able to reproduce. And they call this survival of the fittest. Now, if they've got an advantage, it must be in their genes, it must be in their alleles. And therefore, when they reproduce, the ones that survive, they will pass on these beneficial alleles to the next population. And if this happens over many, many, many generations, small changes will occur and start to accumulate, which could end up leading to any, the formation of a new species. Now these six steps we can uh, remember and we can uh, summarize with the little an acronym VOSAG. Now, as already mentioned uh, earlier, for a species to survive and be successful, it will need to be very well adapted to its environment. Eventually, it will find a particular role to play in its ecosystem. We call this its ecological niche. An ecological niche will include its specific habitat, its behavior, the way it uses resources, all sorts of things will determine what niche an organism has in its environment. It will be completely specific to itself. It was, if its niche overlaps with another organism, then that means they are competing for the same niche and it's very unlikely that they will be able to survive. Now, over long periods of time, species may evolve to make use of more different or less overlapping sets of resources. They're more likely to survive if there's less competition. Let me give you this example here. Now, in this example, you can see 11 species of anole lizards. Now, they are all occupying a different niche by eating different veg vegetation or using different amounts of sunlight or moisture or living at slightly different elevations. So they can all coexist because they are all actually evolved very specifically to occupy one ecological niche and they are not therefore in direct competition with each other. Divergent evolution is where two or more species diverge from a common ancestor. So uh, some of the original population can become isolated maybe and these could maybe uh, be subjected to different selection pressures and then the genotype will change and therefore the phenotype can change so much that eventually these populations can become separate species. Now when this happens, when organisms diverge like this and change so much, then a whole new species can be formed, which is called speciation. Here's an example. Two closely related species of antelope squirrel live on opposite sides of the Grand Canyon. Due to different selection pressures on each side, they have diverged. Harris's antelope squirrel is on the south rim and the white-tailed antelope squirrel is on the north rim. Another example of divergent evolution is called adaptive radiation. This is when one population diverges or radiates into several distinct different populations. Usually what happens is a new species arrives in a new geographical location and it disperses throughout the new area. And because it's new to that location, there are plenty of ecological niches um, that um, they can fill. And therefore this initial, what we call founder species, the original organism that arrived, can give rise to a host of slightly new different species that are adapted to the different ec ecological niches in each of the geographical locations. The best example of this really is what, uh, what are called Darwin's finches. When Darwin went to the Galapagos Island, he collected specimens of finches and observed slight changes in their beaks, uh, which he found on different islands. Um, and this was because each beak had evolved to be able to eat the types of food that were available, the niche that was available on each of the different islands. Now they all evolved from one original founder species that must have come to the islands and been probably blown across on 
a strong uh, wind from the mainland. Once it arrived there, it went to all the different islands and evolved independently on each island and slightly differently because of the different selection pressures that they found on those islands. Now, this is speciation. Uh, it's adaptive radiation. It's an example of divergent evolution. And we're going to talk much more about speciation and how speciation can occur and different types of speciation in part two of this video. Okay. But for now, let's talk a little bit more about selection. Okay. How do different selection pressures uh, mean the survival of different organisms? So as already explained, the environment, selection pressures as it's known, select which individuals survive and therefore which genes will get passed on and how a species will evolve. This process is called selection. There are three different types of selection that we're going to look at. Stabilizing selection, directional selection and disruptive selection. Let's just take a typical population first. Now within any population there is always a range of variation. The majority of the population will be around the mean, around the middle here, and then there'll be a few of, uh, at the extremes of the variation. You could look at, at height, for example, height in humans. Most people are of an average height around the mean, and then you've got, as you go further away from the mean, you've got less and less of the population are either very, very short or very, very tall. In this example I've got on uh, this presentation, you can see beetle wing color. Now the average beetle wing color there is sort of uh, dark green, but um, some have the variation where they are very, very dark green, and some have gone a lighter color. Um, so this is what we call a normal distribution, the initial normal distribution of the variation of this species. And we're going to look at how this shifts, this variation, this selection uh, shifts ba based on different selection pressures. So let's look at stabilizing selection first. Now this is selection that uh, preserves the characteristics of a population by favoring the average individual. Okay, so it really favors the average individual. And what that means is that the extremes uh, die out because they can't compete and we get um, the population stabilizes around the mean uh, of the variation. Here's a couple of examples. What about human birth weight? Small babies and large babies have a much higher mortality rate uh, compared to medium-sized babies, so that's stabilizing selection. Or what about something like heterozygote advantage? Okay, this is an interesting example. If you're a heterozygote, what that means is you have one allele, uh, one of each allele for a particular gene. Okay, let's take the example of, some, uh, of a disease called sickle cell anemia. Now, if you have sickle cell anemia, it's a genetic condition. You, um, if you have it, then you'll have a, a both the recessive alleles, okay? And it can, can make you quite sick. You can't, your red blood cells change shape and you can't carry oxygen properly anymore. If you are what we call a carrier, if you have one of each, if you're a heterozygote for sickle cell anemia, um, then strangely enough, this actually makes you immune to catching malaria. So in some locations where malaria is very prevalent, it's actually a selective advantage to be a carrier, to be a heterozygote for sickle cell anemia. So if you look at the population um, of people who are carriers, genetic carriers of, of um, sickle cell anemia, you find huge numbers in areas where malaria is very, very high because it means they're not ill enough, they don't have both the recessive value, so they don't get proper uh, sickle cell anemia but they're actually immune to malaria, so they can survive that. So again, it's stabilizing the population there. The next one we'll look at is directional selection. Now this is when the population shifts in one way or the other to one of the extremes. It shifts left or it shifts right. Okay, so again, looking at the beetle wing color here, we can see that it has shifted. So actually now the lighter color beetle is favored. It's more, it's, uh, more popular as it were. Okay, here's a few examples. What about the beak size in Galapagos finches? Come back to the Galapagos finches example again. The beak size in the finches move towards bigger or smaller depending on the food source and the cl climatic conditions. Okay, another example is what we'll talk more about in part two of this video is antibiotic resistance. Bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics due to mutations. These resistant bacteria then survive, reproduce, and the population shifts towards this new variation. And the uh, average is, is no longer uh, selected for, and it shifts in direction. Disruptive selection 
is probably the least common type of selection, but it's also the most important in bringing about significant evolutionary change. Now what happens here is when, this is when the extremes of the phenotypes, the variation, are selected for. Okay, so go back to our beetle wing colour example, the really dark beetles and the really light beetles are both selected for, and the ones in the middle are not. Okay, there's some examples here. What about um, Pseudocrea uritis? Now, they, these are a type of butterfly, and they, are, they mimic uh, other species which are inedible to birds. Now, either you want to be one type or another of the extreme. If you're somewhere in the middle, if you're in the middle there, then you're selected against. You need to really mimic strongly one type of the butterfly or another type of the butterfly. So the intermediates are selected against and the two extreme values are selected for. So the population starts to change and shift in that direction. Or this example here, Pyronestes ostrinus. Uh, these are um, uh, a type of uh, black-bellied seed cracker uh, bird as they're known, um, and large beaks and small beaks can fill the niche, but intermediate ones are selected against. Now in part two of the video, we'll discuss a lot more about the factors that affect evolution, such as environmental stress, and we'll delve deeper into speciation and the processes that can cause it, and also we'll talk more about extinction.